our talk today about grad rings and tassels, or tassels and grad rings. And if it wasn't for my dear wife, I would not have found any of my tassels, and she happened to find one. I have no idea where my Moncton High tassel is, but she framed this one, probably under lock the key to keep you from losing it, from uh, Acadia. I've graduated from three different Bible schools and high school as well, and this is the only tassel that remains. <laughs>
someone know that you've been here. Well, you've left your mark on the school. You've left your mark on your friends for a season. And the high school grads, you're about to find out one of the truths that youth leaders all across the world tell you in high school. Some of the friends, some of the closest friends you've had, you won't see them again. You're about to make some brand new friends. You're about to make a new step in your life. And you're going to look back and you're going to ask yourself in your first couple years of university or your first couple years of working or maybe while you're traveling across Europe or whatever you're doing, you're going to be asking yourself, what have I done with my life? How did I spend that year? Those years. What have I done with my life? It becomes a point of reference. They act like markers. How am I doing now? It's kind of like when you go home and, and you're and your parents sometimes, they, they, they put you and your sisters and brothers and they take a little pencil mark and see, how tall have you gotten? It's a marker. How much have you grown? You know, you can fail a course and still learn a lot. You can grow a lot under duress. You can grow a lot. I can remember thinking that some of my courses, like, that mark does not reflect how much I learned from that course. Because A and B were happening when I was trying to write that paper, or, or such and such was happening. You know, the grad ring and the tassel are great accomplishments, but you can't stay there. You cannot stay there. You can go back to upgrading, mind you, but can you imagine 34 years old, still rolling the high school, with your big high school jacket on, you know, walking around, it'd be creepy. <laughs> you know? Unless you're an arc, then it's kind of cool, right? It's 21 Jump Street or something? I don't know. But really, you can't stay there. It's kind of like getting your, your license to drive a scooter at the age of 14. That's cool at 14. When you're trying to take your family to the McDonald's drive through at 34 or 40, it's not so cool. You have to continue growing. You can't stay where you were. You can't stay and live off of the dreams and the accomplishments that you have already achieved because when you receive that gravity and you receive that tassel and you move it over, it means that part of your journey is finished. And it's a hallelujah moment. It's, woo! And you'll all be throwing your hats up in the air and you realize, ooh, I paid a rental. I had to find my hat and bring it back. You know, it's one of those funny things. You know, my granny Dot, she used to say, that education is the lightest thing that you can carry around with you wherever you go. But I would add that it's one of the weightier things that you can add to your relationships, to your leadership situations, to just life in general. And so when you have this checkpoint, when you have these touchstones, those things that remind you, I mean, the coffee was really good, but it ran out. I need to get more. Maybe they had something even better. I need to try new coffees. Not all at once, though. That'd be kind of bad. But they remind you as it's a point of achievement. In life's journey, they act as a trophy. A point of significance in your life. You know, God sometimes sends us promotions. And, and His promotions don't always look like the promotions we think. You know, like... Uh, Suddenly I'm going to work for Google and I'm going to get to get to eat those Google burgers. Have you ever seen some of the things that they have? Like a donut bottom, a double cheeseburger with bacon middle and a donut top. And it's just like, it's like, yeah, it's a heart attack burger. I don't know what they call it, but a promotion in God's sense doesn't always mean a promotion in our way. You look at, uh, look at some biblical examples. You look at uh, Daniel. Here he was, his nation has just been sacked. It's just been absolutely destroyed. And so as part of the penance, as part of the punishment for rebelling against the powers that be, a lot of young men were sent to Babylon. And they were sent there to train pretty much as slaves. They, they, weren't, they, were, they were the nobles' children. They were supposed to become the leaders, the cream of the crop of Israel, and their plans were totally shaken. He was demoted, but ended up becoming Going through those hard times, he ended up becoming the wisest of all the magicians in Babylon. He had to learn all the things they taught him, but he always went back to God and he was faithful to God. I'm actually going to do a series on Daniel later on in the summer, so I don't spoil too much of that. But his demotion ended up becoming a promotion. 
Think of Joseph, his coat of many colors. You know, in, in the family dynamics of those tribes, people don't understand. He was the only son from Isaac's favorite wife. All the other sons were sent out in the fields. He was made to stay at home. He was being set up, even though he was the youngest, he was being set up to be the leader. He was given that coat of many colors. He was shown, being shown to the others that I'm going to be the boss of you when dad kicks off because I'm from the favorite mom. Right? Oh yeah, you're his handmaidens. Your mom is his handmaiden. What's that? I'm Rachel's. That's why it's so significant later on when Benjamin comes on the scene. But anyways, they take him and they demote him. He was headed to be the head of the tribes of Israel and was demoted. But his demotion took him to a promotion, took him to a point of where he was the second in charge of the entire kingdom of Egypt. Think about David. David wanted to marry Michael. That's a girl, by the way. And, uh, or Michelle, maybe. Michelle, something. And when he married her, in order to marry her, he had to get a hundred body parts from some Philistines. And he was put in charge of a thousand elite soldiers. And Saul was actually trying to kill him. Go to the front lines. Bring him back those body parts. Don't ask for body parts in public place. It's bad. And so, his demotion ended up to promotion because God helped him in the midst of that to be able to accomplish the things that God had set for him. These touchstones, they act as a reminder. Sometimes in relationships we're left with scars. Sometimes in life we're left with scars. I was attacked by a dog once and I'm left with emotional scars which I pretty much conquered and, and a, a physical scar. But we need those kind of things to remind us that God gets us through. K. Joe sang it. Stuart prayed it. We have a faithful God. One of the blessings and curses of being a human is that we're good at forgetting. Some of us better than others. Some of us have a special home where we go and we're really good at it. But God has given us special reminders. He's given us the symbol of the cross to remind us of his faithfulness. You know, each generation has to come up in their own mind and in their own heart to decide, is God going to be faithful to me? So for the graduates who receive their tassels and their grab rings, you're up against, maybe not yet, but maybe in September, for some of you getting married here, have new challenges and new journeys coming ahead. And I want to take you to a moment in Joshua 3 where they came up to the Jordan River. For 40 years the Israelites had wandered the desert. Wandered while they were following the cloud by day and the pillar, pillar of fire by night. God took them to the Jordan River. He took them to the Jordan River at the, at the peak flood season. And you got to realize that the peak flood season, like usually the Jordan River would be about 50, 50 meters across. It wasn't too bad. Spies could get across, spies could get back. But in the flood season, it was up to a mile across. Let's put that in our heads. Football players, 18 football fields, lengthwise. That's fine. Maybe if you want to send a couple spies out, maybe Zach and Sam could swim across. Go spout the land, swim back across, get the train right for it. But you've got the elderly, you've got the animals. They say it's about 150 feet deep in the flood season. This was the flood season. You compare that to the St. John River. St. John River flows faster, but at the mouth of the harbor, it's about 150 meters across. Right? That's a lot smaller. But I don't even know if I could make it across that. And so they came up to this impossible situation. And you got to remember, like, it's marshy and it's muddy. The river has overflowed, overflowed its banks. And I don't even know if they could have seen across the other side. 
They might have seen something, they knew that there was another side. And yet God had brought them to this point. God was transitioning leadership, God was transitioning everything. He's transitioning their lives, and it brought them to this impossible wall. They knew that there was a promised land. Just like God has a promised land for each of us. He has an inheritance for each of us to, 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 to capture. But there's this impossible wall. Is God going to do it for us? He did it for Moses. And when Jeremy read, we recognize that God did it for Joshua as well. Will he do it for us? Will he be faithful for me? Will he be faithful to you today in whatever that Jordan River impassable in the natural? Well, I believe he will be. They sent the priests first, which isn't what you normally do when you're invading someone's land. They don't send guys without weapons. They sent these guys into the Jordan River, and the miraculous happened. The water stopped 21 miles up the, up the river. The river dried up, and they crossed. Even, I think, if you had seen the wall of the river rising, I think it would still take faith to cross that mile. What if God suddenly decided that he was going to wipe us out? <laughs> what kind of God are we serving here? Can we trust him? It's very much like tithing, right? We tithe, we trust God, but every week it's like, comes through, right? We come to the Jordan River. We come to these impossible situations. Is God going to come through? I believe He is. I believe He will. God has a mission and a plan for us. And sometimes it's like when you're a new young driver. They used to have it so that the driver instructor would sit in the passenger side with his own set of brakes. Right? Convenient. And sometimes it feels like as a church, and in our own lives, God is bringing us to the Jordan River. He has made a way. And he wants to take us forward, but we've got both feet on the brakes. We're trying to instruct God how to drive our lives. We've got to take our feet off the brakes and move ahead in courage, in the face of fear. I think that God, is, if I might suggest this morning, has three different areas of mission for us. Daily mission. Are you available? What happens when the church is scattered? Between Sunday and Sunday? What happens when you're not alone, not with all your Christian brothers and sisters? Are you available on a daily basis to be used by God? I believe there's a family mission. I believe that God wants you to invest in your immediate family. It doesn't matter how old you are. Sam, you can minister to your dad. Chocolate bars. There's ways you can have how can you minister to your family? I believe that God wants us to invest in our church family. I believe that God wants us to be involved in a body of Christ and wants us to use the gifts and the dreams and the visions he's given us in order to build up the local community of the body of Christ, but also to love our neighbors. I believe that God has a life mission for us as well. And for our grads, I want to ask you this question. What evokes You know, I'm excited that Jason is going to Guatemala. That tells me there's a passion in his heart. There's a heart that is broken for missions. But where is God breaking your heart? Maybe you're like K. Joe and you want to worship the Lord in singing. Maybe you're secretly practicing your music and God is putting a passion in your heart. What is your life mission? I'll prepare for it. As a church, we look at our, at our society, we look at Canada, and the brothers look at St. John, and we see some churches are closing. And we ask ourselves, what was going to happen? Is God going to be faithful with this big Jordan River? And I say yes. You know, there's no Gideon without 300,000 Midianites invading his country. There's no David without Goliath no Daniel of the lion's den. There's no Hellcrest without... Well, I don't know what. I don't know what 
challenges we'll have to face as a, as a congregation. But I tell you, if this church burned down, I'm still your pastor. And you're still my people. And we still have a mission. This church is not the building. The church is us. The mission is us in our lives. It's not just the celebration of God, so that's important. We have to realize that just like the grads have received their, their rings and their tassels, and life sends you all sorts of goodies that you can remember. We look at our own church and we think, wow, we've had some great moments. We've had some great things happen here. We've had incredible musicals. We've had incredible choirs. We've had incredible ministry. And they're great. And they've left their mark on our lives. And it gives us a point of reference to say, hey, we've had some accomplishments. But it's not good enough. We cannot stay there. We need to move out into our mission field. I'm going to read this. This is from A.A. A. Milne. You might know better as the author of uh, Winnie the Pooh. And here's Pooh talking to Eeyore. And it says, you can't stay in your corner of the forest waiting for others to come to you. You have to go to them sometimes. You know, and I think this is where church chats is at in general. We need to rediscover our mission. We need to rediscover our purpose. We don't throw away our, our touchstones. We look at them and we remind ourselves what we've been through and where we've been. But we move ahead. Trusting that the Lord, God Almighty, is faithful. And that He will give us these things to remind us that when our children ask us, what are those for? We can say, oh, let me tell you how God worked a miracle in the life of Helpers Baptist Church, in the life of Andrew Morse, in the life of I believe that God has a plan and a mission for each of us. But it's up to us that when He makes the way for us to cross the river. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you've given us touchstones in our life. Lord, just like in that story of Joshua, where young men were picked to grab stones from the River Jordan, to carry out of the River Jordan, to remind children later on that God did a miracle. God brought them through, that God brought them across a one mile wide river. It was a miracle. And I thank you, God, that you've given us touchstones here, that you've already taken this church and you've moved us ahead and God, you're taking us even further. As Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you reveal to us your mission in our lives and for our families.